And for that beating that he got, where they put out his American flag, where they broke through the ring of protesters who had gone through all the proper steps to have a properly permitted protest, they had to pay $225,000. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. This is Mr. Johnson. And Mr. Johnson is back in the news, June 11th, Cleveland to pay $225,000 to 2016 Republican National Convention protester who was arrested during a flag burning. Now, so we already know the outcome of this, but I'm going to go over his complaint a little bit. And then we're going to talk about some of the history of the law. This is in the District Court for the North Northern District of Ohio, Eastern Division. I almost said Northeastern District of Ohio. Northern District of Ohio, Eastern Division. Gregory Lee Johnson versus the City of Cleveland. And a note for the editor, please blur out his address there. This case arises from an extraordinary breakdown of the rule of law in Cleveland. High schoolers know that burning the American flag is symbolic speech protected by the First Amendment. And he's going to cite to Texas v. Johnson, a uh, 1989 Supreme Court case which um, it said that Texas law banning the, burden, uh, banning the burning of the flag was illegal, it was unconstitutional. But what you may not have noticed, and good for you if you did, is that Texas v. Johnson and Johnson v. Cleveland is the same Johnson. It's the very same person. So the guy got arrested in 1989. His case went to the Supreme Court, or not in 1989, but he got arrested before 1989. His case went up to the Supreme Court, and in, in 1989, the Supreme Court ruled that burning the American flag is symbolic speech and therefore protected by the First Amendment. Well, in POTUS's defense, God, I never thought I'd say those words, the decision was five to four. So that's more closer to something that could be overturned. However, First Amendment, Constitution, freedom of speech, these are all very, very strong values for both Republicans and liberals, or and Democrats, conservatives and liberals. There is really no dispute about the importance of the freedom of speech. What I see happening from time to time is people forget that value and sort of override it with a I want my enemy to have no rights kind of thing. I want to take away the rights of my enemy. I don't like Joey Johnson or Gregory Johnson. I don't know why it's called Joey Johnson. Um, I, don't know, I, I don't like him, so therefore I'm going to find a way to make what he does illegal. That, that, that's that kind of chipping away at individual liberties so that we can make the we can shape the world or sculpt the world into our individualized vision of it is exactly why we have constitutional protections in the first place because it is an entirely human well it's not not just human but it is definitely a human problem or human instinct to not just gather power and but to also take down those around us to to commit offenses against those that we don't like, etc. And no, we are civilized. We rise above this and we uphold our constitution for everyone. Burning a flag doesn't hurt anyone. Arguably, someone bought a flag to burn, so they're actually paying for it. It's stimulating the economy in some way if you really want to get to it, but it's their freedom to do so. No one is being hurt. At least the accusation isn't that burning a flag by itself creates a dangerous condition that, that hurts other people. No, 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 no. If somebody was burning a flag while burning people with it, that's different. We're just talking about the symbolic act of burning a flag. And let's not forget that burning a flag is the preferred way to respectfully retire it. And Kurt and I did this last Memorial Day. We retired a flag on camera, did a whole video about it, and you can go watch our video, Retiring a Flag by Burning under the US Flag Code. Uh, so do not understand why the concept of freedom of speech is so malleable to some people. And I don't mean, that's not, that's, not a, that's not a pretext. I'm not saying some people just means Donald Trump or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of people on both sides of the political spectrum, on both extremes. And maybe there's even some people in the middle who maybe aren't, shouldn't be in the middle if they're taking such an extreme position, that freedom of speech, that they say freedom of speech doesn't override the burning of the flag. I don't, I don't understand how you can come to that conclusion when we've had so much case law on it, there was another case in 1990, right after Texas v. Johnson, 
that established that the flag burning ban was unconstitutional against the whole United States, not just Texas. So back to this real quick. High schoolers know that burning the American flag is symbolic speech. They know because plaintiff Gregory Lee Johnson did so at the Republican National Convention in 1984. The Supreme Court's landmark declaration of his right and the bedrock constitutional principle it represents is so fundamental to our highest law to be curricular, as in part of institutional education. The city of Cleveland ignored that lesson when it hosted the RNC convention, Republican National Convention, in 2016 and arrested Mr. Johnson for burning a flag. Through its police force and prosecutors who swear to uphold the Constitution and assisted by all too willing extremists who believe physical assault on flag burners is their patriotic duty, the city censored Mr. Johnson and retaliated against him for exercising the same First Amendment freedom to burn an American flag under the same circumstances the Supreme Court declared was his right literally his right, nearly 30 years ago. The city knew that, that he was that Johnson, the one who burned the flag. He announced his plan in advance with a press release and media advisory, and the city detailed undercover officers to follow him to the designated free speech zone he announced would be the site of his protest. But the officers did not perform their constitutional duty to protect Mr. Johnson's peaceful expression, a duty the city police chief would concede and admit knowing nor were they adequately, or at all, trained on mandatory First Amendment constraints on policing the protected speech they knew would arise, despite the millions of dollars the city spent quartering troops at Cleveland universities and implementing comprehensive law enforcement protocols. I don't know what that means, quartering troops at Cleveland universities. That seems kind of unnecessary. Uh, instead, and consistent with decades-old force-wide tradition of disdain for the First Amendment rights of flag burners, the city only took measures to shut him down. Assisted by federal law enforcement officers, its police officers surveilled RevCom, the protest group that formed a protective circle around Mr. Johnson so he could safely burn his flag. So he's even safely burning his flag, you know, with a circle of people protecting him. So he's not burning anyone. The officers broke that circle before he began to light the flag, lunging at him to prevent it from burning and deploying cold fire from fire extinguishers the moment its corner lit. They literally extinguished his speech. They then dragged him to the ground where, prone and compliant, he was kicked and punched by the very men the city would charge him with assaulting. The city did not charge them with assault, though it had ample video evidence, including one of his assailants' body camera footage, which conveniently disappeared irretrievably when Mr. Johnson's criminal defense counsel asked for it, and their self-published YouTube braggadocio in which they not only confessed to assaulting him, but pronounced their criminal acts as valorous and patriotic. Instead, the city Kate carted Mr. Johnson off to jail and held him without charge for 24 hours with feeble excuses about locked courtrooms until the salient period for their protest had expired. The city successfully silenced protected speech directed at the Trump campaign's aggressive nationalism, taking lawful protesters off the board during days three and four of the convention, when now President Trump delivered his address, distorting the public conversation about the man who became president through the strategic use of force. The city and its officers needed that time to find something to charge Mr. Johnson with because the desecration charge of one of its officials scrawled on an arrest board had been declared unconstitutional as a result of the very man they held in jail. So the city enlisted all too willing patriots to justify its arrest, attempting fraudulent medical reports to bolster the retaliatory charge for which it prosecuted him, misdemeanor assault on two members of the media. Ample, spelled correctly this time, and contemporaneously available video captured the unlawfulness of the arrest. But the city did not release him because continuing to silence Mr. Johnson's famous protest served the interests of the city prioritized over his First Amendment rights. As the city was acutely aware, the RNC put Cleveland on the world stage and the city was powerfully motivated to be seen as a capable host for a seamless convention, so it kept him incarcerated as long as it could. While its officers scrambled to find something to charge, drafting and discarding report after report, the city took to the press. Defendant Williams convened two press conferences to defend his officers' unlawful actions, untroubled by any rebuttal from his prominent detainee. 
The Division of Police's hyperactive Twitter account, which had promised Mr. Johnson would be met with fire suppressants before his protest began, applauded the officers. For their part, the self-styled reporters from Infowars proclaimed victory over communism from a local bar, basking in adulation and anticipated profits from the consumers of hateful rhetoric and snake oil supplements that constitute their audience. Quote, I ripped the guy's shirt off and just punched him and kicked him, man. You know what? I'm a fucking veteran. My buddies died for this country and you're going to burn this flag in front of me? Screw you. It's not going to happen. So we just did everything we could. Well, now I'm going to go and submit this in and then go after Revcom because these guys are un-American bastards. This is America and we are here to defeat communism. Revcom for prison. You know, if you're here to defeat communism, you could maybe stop the Russian interference in the elections. Just saying. The day after the Infowars video was published, the city informed Mr. Johnson that he would be charged for assaulting them. And it pursued the charge against Mr. Johnson for six months, declining to dismiss it in light of the Infowars confession, claiming to have mislaid the body camera footage it obtained from defendant Biggs. Conspicuously, Biggs, a prolific vlogger who produced a virtually uninterrupted video stream of his antics, never posted it himself. The city continued to prosecute Mr. Johnson over the ensuing politically charged months, which saw the election of President Trump and his declaration that flag burners should be jailed. Mr. Johnson suffered the distress and injustice of the trumped-up charge until it was finally and voluntarily dismissed on January 11, 2017, just before Trump's inauguration. Mr. Johnson's persecution in Cleveland was no patrolman's error. It was ratified by the city's continuing retaliation against him, and it repeats a calculated assault on the rule of law, the culmination of a decades-old practice by Cleveland police officers to seek unlawful convictions on the basis of unpatriotic symbolic speech. By this civil rights action, brought under 42 U.S.C. 1983 and Ohio law, Mr. Johnson seeks to hold the city of Cleveland, its police officers, and their co-conspirators responsible for violating the constitutional right the Supreme Court guaranteed him and vindicate his First Amendment freedom to protest the American government by burning its flag. And for that beating that he got, where they put out his American flag, where they broke through the ring of protesters who had gone through all the proper steps to have a properly permitted protest, they had to pay $225,000. Now, I guess I don't know. I think that's the entire case. I don't think that there's any further case against the individual officers or anything, but uh, I haven't seen the actual dismissal stipulation yet, so uh, I don't know whether it actually gets rid of every claim against every party or just against Cleveland. Keep in mind, we just talked last week about a Oberlin-based college in Ohio that also took the law into its own hands and has to pay now somewhere around 40-some million dollars. I'm going to guess the final number will be 43 million dollars because it'll be 33 total plus 10 million in attorney's fees, something around there. So about $43 million so that it could also have its way instead of following the law. Don't understand what is going on these days. This isn't, but those two stories that I just mentioned, by the way, the flag burning was, was something that was done, uh, the violation was committed by people who claimed to be right wing. And on the other hand, the Oberlin violations were done by someone who claimed to be left wing. How about there's moderation in the middle? How about we can uphold the Constitution, we can allow Mr. Johnson to burn a flag without anybody getting hurt, and even a $20 flag being purchased at a store, and we can allow Gibson's Bakery to catch a shoplifter without hurting anyone and not have to beat the Gibsons and not, I mean, physically, literally beat the Gibsons, which is what the two girls did, and not have to lie about the attack and not have to then protest the store for months for catching a shop. Could you imagine the world we would live in if every time a shoplifter was caught, there were massive protests? Wow. Anyway, so that's really stupid, and I thought that you'd like to hear about that. What do you think about that? Really, really dumb thing for the taxpayers of Cleveland to have to spend their hard-earned money on now, isn't it? Especially when the law is so clear. The law is just absolutely clear on this. That's our show, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to check out sponsus.org as an alternative to Patreon, but thank you very much to all of our supporters on both patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.org slash u slash lawful masses. 
At the $50 level for the month of June, our supporters are John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Aspernari, and Snorri Wazatsky. And at the $5 level, we will have people in the description below, as I don't have a scrolling LED panel, which is one of our favorite perks to do. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your support. And I'll just leave time here for the editor to insert some, uh, some dog video or Scotland video or whatever I've got for you. Some personal video, because I'd like to share. Anyway, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you to Brandon for joining me today on stream. I love you all. I will see you from the USA next week. And the week after that, I think Kaylee's going to be in the US. So looking forward to having her in the US for the summer during her break uh, from her job. Anyway, love you all. Have a good day. Bye.